Welcome to the Insights Overflow podcast, episode three. I'm Andrew Bosma, your host, and I'm joined today by AI ethics guru, Professor Johan Stein. In today's ever-changing world of technology, artificial intelligence is permeated through the very fabric of our day-to-day lives. In this episode, we'll be talking about the impact of AI on humanity, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. We'll also unpack some unique ways AI can benefit the human species, specifically on our African continent. So grab your popcorn and get ready for an AI roller coaster ride with Professor Johan Stein on the Oculus Insights Overflow podcast. Hello and welcome to the Insights Overflow podcast, the show where we talk to customers, partners and industry leaders. We talk about the lessons that they've learned and their successes in order to make an impact. On episode three, I'm joined by Johan Stein, who is a professor at Waxen University, a research fellow at Stellenbosch University and a thought leader in the AI space. Welcome. Andrew, Johan. good to see you. Thank you. So basically today I want to talk about AI um, and its sort of impact on society. But I also want to dive a little bit deeper sort of into um, into what you do on a, on a daily basis and sort of your story and your, um, your journey into AI and sort of where you see the next sort of five to 10 years going. So, you know, your bio is sort of thought leader, right? Um, but you've got a unique um, and sort of special approach in that it's not necessarily about the intricacies of how AI works. It's more around hey, how AI is going to affect humanity and, you know, what is that human centric um, impact that AI is going to have. And, you know, I think that's sort of often overlooked, you know, because we tend to focus on technology. Um, but I'd like to hear, you know, from from your point of view, like sort of your definitions of what is human centric AI, and why is it so important, and and why do we have to have these conversations about how it's going to affect humanity and sort of our daily lives? It's a topic I love speaking about because I am actually really passionate about it. And to your point, I think most of the discourse about AI and technology is about the tech. It's driven by technologists, very smart people, and we absolutely need them. Or it's driven by academics uh, in a very academic way. But, you know, sometimes for me, it's just to sit down, take a breath and say, but what is this doing to people? Because for the first time in our history, we have technology that's got a massive impact on what it means to be human. And and we can maybe touch on some of that, what's consciousness when we get to the future part of the conversation. And I've seen it with most of the clients I deal with. They approach this technology in a technology-only way. Mm. And the technology is driven solely by the technology people in the organization. But more and more, we need to see that HR, organizational design, change management people, people from different disciplines, form part of the core group that drives this technology. Because the techies... They are, you know, they have a hammer and they're looking for a nail. They will AI Absolutely. everything if they can. Absolutely. You know? yeah, but what will it, um, and obviously the job displacement, displacement conversation is maybe the biggest one. As we automate, what do we actually do with people? It's so easy to say we're just going to train them up. But if you think of human nature and what human beings are like, a lot of people like coming in at eight, leaving at five, doing the same job every day. That's, and we, I call them the worker bees. We need those people. But to say we're just now going to automate it and make you all AI engineers or c- teach you coding and so forth. So um, what it will do to people is an ethical, but it's also a smart business conversation. And the one example I often use is if you want to automate the work that, say, the front desk staff do. And I had this um, example at a hospital that I did some consulting work for. All these C-suite people were drawing these pictures about how they're going to automate things. But they never spoke to the actual people whose jobs they're planning to automate. Mm -hmm. And the problem there is that there's wisdom and knowledge and experience in those people that you can never imagine 15 levels above them. And then you end up automating things that won't actually make a difference. So I'm always just trying to encourage the people I speak with um, and the companies I deal with 
is let it be people first, not from a kumbaya point of view, because we are driving businesses and you've got shareholders and KPIs. Yeah. But there are things that AI can't do, that only humans can do. And you have to smartly think about that. I think you offer a very unique perspective that not a lot of people can offer because you see a lot of different businesses and a lot of businesses reach out to you um, from like a industry barometer point of view. Because mm. obviously you do consulting, you do public speaking, mm. you're uh, associated with um, research institutes. Um, and, you know, what are the sort of common threads that you're seeing across the, the customers that call on you um, to consult on? Mm. You know, what are, you, what are they trying to do and, and what are they calling on you for uh, to help them with. Yeah, I think some of the, the main threads I see, and this is across industry or company size, is that the C-suite don't understand this technology at all. And okay. studies show that about 70% of senior business leaders don't understand it. And why do they have to understand it? Of course, they don't have to become experts. But the, the impact on the organization, again, that responsibility should lie with the senior leaders. Mm. And they should know when either vendors or their own tech teams are trying to pull the wool over their eyes. They need to know what is AI, what are some of the potential impacts on the workforce and so forth. So that's the first thing. Okay. So a lot of the work I do is educating senior leaders in business terms about what is this technology. There's a lot of misunderstanding. I blame Hollywood uh, for it mostly, mm -hmm. or some consulting firms, you know, where they think you can just fix everything with AI. Yeah. You know, um, the other one is, is this misunderstanding of, as I mentioned, the impact on people and the organization. It's the misunderstanding of how limited this technology still is, even though it is growing exponentially stronger now in this generative AI chat GPT mm -hmm. phase that we're in. But there's a lot of problems that AI will never be able to fix. I fixed more problems with Excel than with AI in my career. You know? yeah. um, business processes that's not being understood. That's another big threat that I see. Um, the impact on not just your people, but on the environment. So like mining companies, they want to, mm -hmm use technology to smarter extract minerals, etc. But what about the um, underwater or the water supply of communities around them? What about the air quality? So you have to come back to, uh, again, that human centric view while still driving uh, the business. I think finding funding for these uh, initiatives is a, a, a problem for a lot of organizations. And maybe the biggest threat across the world, but especially in our country is the lack of skills. I, we have a huge problem in that regard. And the challenge we have, even from primary to secondary school and definitely in tertiary education, is we don't teach uh, young people to be data literate. No. And I think that's maybe, maybe that is, of all I've just said, the biggest problem we're facing in this country in particular. And, I mean, you've probably seen people doing it well, people doing it badly. You know, are there any sort of mm. funny stories that you can, yeah. or funny anecdotes of people you know, trying or doing really great stuff and, and people doing really, really poor stuff. Yes. The people who do it well understand the technology at the top. Um, and they have a good strategy around which internal people can we upskill or use and what's the balance between bringing in a vendor because there's a good case for that, bringing in the experts in a win-win engagement, mm -hmm. but make sure that they leave a certain amount of IP and upskilling with your team before they go because when I've worked for some of the, the large consulting firms. Your job is to want to stay there as long as you can. You know? Absolutely. So it's understanding the technology. The other thing that I've seen that causes a successful rollout is starting in the right area and starting small. You know, pick the area that is right for it. So your typically your back office, your repetitive tasks, your human capital management or HR teams are a great uh, place to start because if you think of uh, L&D, learning and development, you know, so much you can do with personalizing or individualizing training through the data you have on your people. Um, and then get cadence, the best change management. It's not posters across the walls and in the bathrooms and speeches. Mm. It is a team that says, even though we fear this technology, we're actually enjoying our jobs more. It is successful. We don't have to do the 10 p.m. report on a Sunday night for the 8 a.m. Monday uh, morning meeting anymore. Yeah. And then word starts spreading. And so you, it's starting small. It's understanding it at the top and the right balance between bringing in the skills from outside. I have more stories about it going wrong. And so the one is yeah. this hospital story, you know, they just want to automate and AI everything. End of last year, I spoke with a chief 
information officer at one of our large uh, investment banks. And he said to me that his mandate from the board is to AI 50% of the business. And right there I said to him, I don't even know what that means. Um, and this is one of the, the threats that, I, sorry, the, the key themes I see when it goes wrong is a mandate from the top. We went to some Gartner um, or conference or a vendor conference. Now we're just going to AI everything. And if your bonus and your promotion and your KPIs are dependent on AIing stuff, you're going to find everything to AI and it's going to be a mess. Mm. Uh, I often ask my clients, what is the real end goal of smart automation, AI, et cetera, in your business. And they rightly say things like lowering costs, uh, moving faster, better customer satisfaction. Of course, those things are true. But if you want to be a little bit more philosophical, maybe, the end goal of smart automation is relieving people from work that people never should have been doing in any case so that we can focus on the things that's important. Um, and yes, there should be a business case and those things. But just back to the CIO. So he said to me, he needs to AI 50% of his business. And then he asked me how many RPA robots I think he will need. And I couldn't believe that a chief information officer said that because we know AI and RPA, even though there are some overlaps, is fundamental yeah, different kind of technology. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, it's that mandate from the top, that not understanding it, wanting to automate things that make no sense mm. and not taking people on the journey with you. And maybe just to end off the answer on this one is mm. not using the technology that you already have. Yeah. The tech you already have is most likely a big part of the answer you're looking for. Just buying more platforms and so forth is not necessarily the answer. Yeah, we've got a funny story. We did a, a demo to um, a sort of a big finance, a vehicle financing uh, institution in South Africa. And we were obviously demoing our AI module and, and the different things that you can do specifically around credit, uh, credit scoring and credit risk, et cetera. And, you know, we're speaking to the managing director, he's sort of the, the big shot there. Mm. And then he says, well, okay, no, this is, this is great. You know, we can score credit, but, um, you know, do you guys have a model that you can plug in macroeconomic factors, world events, uh, you know, all these variables and just like spit out what somebody should do. <laughs> You know, so it was sort of at that moment we knew, um, you know, I don't necessarily think this demo is going to go anywhere because um, sort of that fundamental understanding of what could truly be achieved and the sort of objective output, um, we weren't aligned in, in, <laughs> in what, what was possible. So that, you know, we've, we've seen a lot in terms of the customers we've spoken to and, and demo to. So, yeah, there's a lot of misconception out there. But I think um, what I want to talk about next is, you know, it this AI space, you know, was it obvious um, that it was going to be as big as it's become? And you obviously saw something a couple of years ago that got you into the space. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't necessarily know, like, uh, I know bits of your journey sort of into this AI space, but it'd be nice to hear, you know, how you actually got to become sort of a, a speaker and a sort of a industry leader in the space. Yeah. Like, what does that journey look yeah. like for you? So Andrew, I was working for one of our large banks and uh, one of the large global um, consulting firms came in and said they want to do a proof of concept using an AI um, platform. This is about eight or nine years ago. Um, and I've never heard, even though I've, I've been in tech most of my life, I've never really heard much of AI, I didn't really understand it. So we thought, okay, let them do it. And we were blown away by what this platform could do. And it's all about pattern recognition, um, et cetera. Yeah. So for instance, we had a large program where we had 100,000 test cases to make sure that the quality of the platform, its banking platform works well. They then through this AI platform picked up that about 80% of our test cases were either inefficient or duplicates. And then the output of this POC was that we lowered the amount of test cases with 90%, but increased our coverage with about 200%. I couldn't believe that this technology could do it. And then I started reading every book I could find my hands on. Mm. Um, about a book a week, which I still do, because wow. you know I'm still daunted by how much this is changing. Yeah. But at the same time, I became a father. And uh, through adoption, as you know, but, and then I thought if, if on the one hand you've got this tech and if it can already do this, and now I've got this boy, the son who 
whose life will be impacted into yeah. the future. And that's when I started looking more at the philosophical, ethical, societal impact side of things. Um, what I also found is that a lot of people across the world in this field are very open to collaborate and to have a chat. Mm. Uh, so I started reaching out to people at Google and Facebook and you know big consulting firms or universities. It's obviously about how you reach out to them on LinkedIn, for instance. And I was... Yeah blown away with how many people whom I consider very important and senior yeah. were okay to have a chat. Almost untouchables. Exactly. Yeah. And then I, I started visiting conferences. And again, back to our earlier point, it was all the tech, tech, tech. And I'm thinking, no one's talking about how it's going to impact us. Um, and then I started speaking at conferences and I kind of found my niche there where, you know, I'm not a technologist and it, it serves me well mm. because I, and even when I deal with clients, I have to almost use common sense more than technology, which most customers don't use in my opinion yeah. and then it's kind of it just escalated and you know I did some work with the UN some with Cambridge and Oxford universities a lot of writing that's also and you'll see there's a certain theme to to what I do and I think and again you made this point earlier that this AI which is a very bad way of explaining this technology I think it's such a multifaceted thing that we need each other's different perspectives and views we also need views from other parts of the world one thing that's still lacking today is the so-called third world. You know, um, we, we don't have an African voice, a strong African voice, if you would, in global affairs when it comes to AI. I remember end of last year, I joined, a, it was actually, in fact, that we did a, a webinar with the UN through IBM. Even though I'm uh, very bleak, I was the only African <laughs> on the panel. And I actually had to bring people's attention to the things you are saying uh, mostly Northern American people, are all true, but it's a representation of your understanding of AI that is very limited compared to the rest of the world. You know, we have societal issues that, uh, I mean, we don't even, we're not even able to feed our children or to provide electricity or pro provide safety in Africa, and especially here. So where does this whole AI conversation fit in? But if you have the luxury like first world countries have, that we can fund it, we can do almost any job we want, we, we can easily be part of the great resignation and just say goodbye and resign. Mm -hmm. it's, most of the world are not like that. And I think that's something that I see. Another thing, and maybe to conclude us on this one, is data sets in the developing world is lacking. In Africa, our medical imagery is we use medical imagery from the global north, so-called, where, for instance, in the world of breast cancer or prostate cancer, we have unique um, illnesses um, in Africa that we, because we don't have the data set on Africans, we don't pick it up. And another one is language. We have about 3,000 languages and dialects in Africa. Most of our chatbot or conversational AI platforms are English or French or Portuguese, etc. So there's a lot of companies that's, or universities that's building that data sets. But I think so that's what drove me. I, I saw the future of my child and of, of our children, and I saw where this technology could go. And some of the books I read um, uh, reminded me of George Orwell and uh, 1984. So uh, I, and we can talk a lot more about that. But I do, the longer I'm in this field, the more my view of the future becomes grim and more grim, even though I'm trying to be f positive. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think I'd almost akin it to think about the end of world war ii and basically the invention of the nuclear bomb right in that singular moment of research it changed the nature of the world forever and that pandora's box could not be closed so the gravity of um, inventing that or discovering that however you want to uh, position it uh, forever changed uh, how we even live today and you know sort of us a, a couple of generations away from world war ii we've got no vote on the past whether they should have or shouldn't have um, discovered that or invented that but yet it fundamentally affects us right now i mean we in all intents and purposes uh, globally might be on the verge of world war three and um, between countries that are nuclear powers um of which we've got no say um so and what's interesting is when you don't have children you don't you you tend to think of yourself sort of quite insular in that you know what you do and your actions affect you and that's fine and and all that but you know i know even from personal experience once you start having kids 
you start understanding that you, even as an individual, are sort of a lineage of of consciousness that sort of extends in the past and extends into the future. And then you start thinking more about, well, my sort of small actions affect my children and fundamentally then will affect their children exactly how our forefathers sort of decisions affected us now. And AI almost feels like that, that same uh, sort of pivotal moment as sort of that nuclear bomb discovery is that, you know, if, if we're not equipping our children or societies to live in a world where the, you know, the, the tables are uneven, you know, mm. think about countries that have nukes and those that don't. Like what negotiation <laughs> leverage do you have if you don't have a nuclear power? I mean, um, you know, even uh, if you look into the history of Ukraine, they actually had to give up their nuclear weapons um, mm. for specific um, sort of uh, sort of financial aids and things. I mean, it's a complicated matter, mm. but um, that fundamentally changed the negotiation leverage, you know, by not having that. Mm. So you take a look at the next generation in terms of skills and you mentioned Africa, you know, if you've got a, an accelerating world that's data literate, AI savvy, um, that's operating in a global environment, and then you've got um, somebody sitting in the southern tip of Africa who, you know, maybe has never seen a textbook, <laughs> he has to learn under a tree, you know, that's, <laughs> that's not a fair uh, balance of power. In, in a lot of ways, and not to say that one can always achieve a fair balance of power, but the disparity between those two things are so huge mm. that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that um, that's not a recipe for a uh, <laughs> for a long term success of 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 everybody uh, on the planet. You know, so it's a very very interesting perspective and. You know, all the research, all the the cool tech is is coming from these very insular environments, mm. um, and you know it's it's important to sort of bring it back down to earth. You know, and I think you're doing a, a great job in that. Thanks. You know, if I may just quickly comment because I'm, I'm mind mapping here in my head because there's so many things you said. Yeah. That but uh, firstly, yes, I think the 1930s when we first split the atom. Um, it was at that time the most powerful technology we've ever created. Imagine we did not regulate it. Because not only can you light up a city with electricity, you can destroy the whole world. And you are right, we are, I think the great, the three great dangers at the moment is nuclear war. And we thought after the end of the 60s with the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, you know, that we would never have this again, but we are not far from nuclear war. Um, and I'm not saying it's going to happen, but one or two things especially with this Ukraine situation, and, and we can see missile launches. Uh, the other one is climate change and artificial intelligence. Those are the three. So I often say to people, and when I do my talks, um, let's imagine in the 1930s, they were so excited about this technology, but they never regulated it. Now we've created the most, now it's not akin to nuclear war, I mean, you can wipe the whole continent, but the impact on us in the future, it is the most powerful technology we've ever created. And it's not regulated. It's across the world almost not regulated. In South Africa, it's not regulated at all. And why are we sitting on our hands? And it's not just government, we all need to play a part, but although governments must play a huge part. One of the good things with this whole chat GPT controversy, and you might have seen the news recently that countries like Italy and now and others are following suit saying, we have to stop this, we have to pause. Um, and then there's the, the thousand odd ethicists and academics recently, and among them Elon Musk who wrote this letter or signed this letter saying, they want a six month monitorium on GPT technology. It's a bit of a hypocritical thing for Musk, in my view. I'm a big fan, but you know he became rich because of AI in Tesla and SpaceX, etc. Now, okay, let's just pause on this. You know, I don't think we can pause it. You know, so but it, if we compare it to nuclear power and and unregulated nuclear power, imagine what AI can do into our future if it's not regulated. I think the only piece of regulation that speaks to AI is around the Poppy Act, where if your information's being used to um, train recommendation models, mm. uh, I think particularly because it came out of sort of credit, mm. um, you sort of have to be made aware that your recommendation was 
AI generated. I think that that's the only regulation I know of that actually even touches on it. But I think we know regulation always lags technology. I mean, if you watch any sort of US Senate hearings, um, say on Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Jack Dorsey of, of Twitter and, uh, back in the day, you know, those sort of old farts, <laughs> they can't even operate their cell phone. Um, and, you know, they, they're saying, well, what's, what is this Facebook, you know? Um, and they, the regulation roadblock or regulation entry point for all these things. So there's, uh, there's such a disparity between those who are in regulatory capacity and those who are in the know in technology. Mm. I mean, yeah, like, <laughs> I don't even know if they even cat can catch up and probably won't. I agree. Uh, but I think that's sort of always, always happened. I mean, if you look at regulating the automobile mm. from horses, you can, I mean, seat belts weren't always a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I think there was a, when the cars first came around, they had to have a guy walking in front of the car with a flag um, to mind the horses mm. and things <laughs> like that, you know? So there's always these very, uh, brute force, rudimentary ways of trying to control this new tech that just sort of take a bit of time to uh, sort of reach its full, um, sort of full glory. But, you know, you can argue that the rate of acceleration is the issue here. I mean, if you look at, for instance, the time for platforms to um, adopt a certain amount of users, I don't know if you've seen that sort of famous mm. graph. I don't know if it was going around on LinkedIn, but it said, okay, cool. So many people to adopt the telephone. And it was like, okay, to get a hundred million, whatever, maybe 10 million, it took 70 years. Okay. To adopt email was like, you know, 15 years. Uh, Facebook took five years to reach a certain Twitter was maybe less. And then, you know, open AI with chat GPT was like five days or something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, so in this connected world of um, sort of hyper-social um, ease of access information, that rate of acceleration to use this technology, I mean, you you couldn't build a billion cars in five days in the 1920s, but, you know, you can reach a billion people in five days with a new piece of tech that you write mm. that sort of can change society, you know, so... I think it's probably the the acceleration rate is is probably the biggest danger, and mm. you know we might be on the right path, we might be on the wrong path, but time usually uh, reveals that, and this feels like um, time is of the essence in a way. Absolutely, um, to and get it right or it's wrong. It's a fine balance between innovation and regulation, because you also you can't stifle the human advance of innovating. We've been doing it for thousands of years you know, since we started using rudimentary tools to dig a hole to find a, mm. a route to eat it or whatever yeah so you can't we will never stop ai's advance ever i don't think it is possible um and the regulators as you rightly say are behind the curve mm. i mean and, and poppy or popia is there's some good regulation there i mean profiling which we can't do i mean profiling is when you use different data sets to get an understanding of your client and they could be a good way of doing it from a customer centric point of view. Mm. But I have to give that organization permission to use different data sets. Correct. The problem, and I was at a, a talk that the information regulator did two months ago. And she said, I mean, Pop PR is this world class legislation, but their ability to enforce it, you know, and she mentioned, for instance, TransUnion, and I mean, this is in the public mm -hmm. domain. We had that massive yeah. breach of 48 million people. Absolutely. So they are pursuing TransUnion. Mm. Uh, but to get ready for the high court case will take months. And also, you know? how how do we make them accountable personally to us? Mm. You know, a lot of um, even sort of to bring up COVID as an example is that, you know, say you had a loved one that um, died from COVID, right? And you say to yourself, okay, well, it wasn't my fault um, the virus was a research experiment or naturally occurring, 
you know, but yet I'm the one to have all the bad things happen because of somebody else's actions. And where does that liability sit? Mm. You know, and, and, you know, data breaches exactly like TransUnion is, well, you know, what I didn't give TransUnion my permission, you know, so how do I help hold them personally accountable? And I can't, I have to go through all these other mm regulatory places and and let the law take its course but yeah. there's no personal recourse for any of us normal citizens yeah. and we given the impact it's having on us and that it will have on our children we should have a a, a way of mm. having a voice mm. i think regulation often follows things going wrong and and the, the you use a good example of the seatbelt. i mean why did they eventually introduce or enforce seat belts because too many people died in car crashes mm. But in the age of exponentially strong and growing technology, what can go wrong before we all have a, oh my word moment, and, mm -hmm. we, and then it's going to take three years of legal battles to uh, legalize it mm -hmm. or legislate it. You know, I don't think people, and this is what drives me, you know, maybe to also to one of your earlier questions, um, and it's not a fear mongering thing, because I'm, I'm, there, are, there are elements of me that's very excited about this technology. The business impact, positive business impact, but if we think of education and healthcare, there are so many good potential use cases. We can create a more utopian world through this technology. And about a year ago, I wrote two articles for Business Day. And the first, uh, the imagination I had was in 30 years from now, my son writes a letter back to me. Okay. Um, and the first one is we regulated this technology, we used it for to for more equal distribution of wealth, more job creation, uh, better healthcare, longevity, and so forth. All those things are possible. And there, we, we if you want to read up on transhumanism, I mean, those people mm -hmm. work a lot on that. Yeah. But I, and then the second article was a dystopian view. Um, and I actually felt quite emotional writing that one. And I often use it in my talks, and I often go and read it again, where he would say, we live in an unthinkably bad world now. We have no more privacy. Social obedience, which is already a reality in China, has spread throughout the world. The world has been colonized from a data point of view. The world is no longer run by governments, but by the Googles and Facebooks of the world, which is kind of in a way the case already. Um, and that you can't have access to credit or to healthcare if you are not on that social obedience score at certain levels mm -hmm. and so forth. Because the, the problem we have is that this haves and have nots, the so-called digital divide, will increase more and more as technology becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. Because the, we already have a problem where that wealth and power is in a very few small hands in this world or in this country even. But what if we create a, and I'd love to talk about this, but this we're creating a new species of human beings essentially. Um, if we think of the brain computer interface, it's a reality already, it's not being uh, rolled out yet, it's still being tested. But what if only a few small, um, uh, say thousand people could have the wealth to use this technology, to change body parts, to become incredibly smart through technology, to hang up for longevity, and all the rest of us don't have that. And yeah, I often refer to Yuval Noah Harari and his book Sapiens, where he says we risk creating what he calls the useless class, mm -hmm. where most jobs are automated away. And only a smaller percentage of people have the wealth and power. Mm -hmm. So um, it, that is where we are going. Unfortunately, I think. You know. <laughs> mm. I think one of the first principle concepts would almost be what does it mean to be human yes. and, you know, take credit as an example. You know, it might be true that our ability to pay our debit orders, our um, income bracket, our race, our um, language, our schooling plays a part in um, our ability to pay back a loan, right? But as a human, how do you distill your sort of limitless characteristics of what makes you unique into an algorithm that you can say, well, this represents 100% of my humanness in this, in this model, mm. you know, so that's sort of always an interesting um, sort of thing to think about is that, you know, do these models truly capture um, sort of the the nuance mm. and um, sort of random nature of humanity and and 
that's quite interesting. And also what I've um, sort of seen lately is that people are talking about AI interacting with AI. So if you think about our normal lives, we our own lives and each one of us, um, even sort of sitting here today, we basically a network of systems, um, you know, in the sense that, you know, you've got inputs and outputs and like an impact on the world that affects my input variables in some fashion that will affect my output, which will then affect somebody else's input variables. So if we had to distill our humanism into algorithms, you can think about sort of societies as like a set of uh, interacting sort of like microsystems. So I think what might be interesting even in the future is that AI won't be singular in its um, function, but instead it will be a network of chat GPTs or uh, workday GPTs or whatever drive GPT, you know, whatever model best suits the use case we're trying to solve. And these AI systems will essentially interface with one another that sort of might be controlled by like a meta AI that's basically um, sort of orchestrating these things, you know. So, so yeah, in, in one way, um, there you're never going to sort of distill humanity into some sort of algorithm. But in a lot of ways, our daily lives emulate sort of interaction interacting systems and you can understand why um, from a research point of view like you'd want to like pursue that because it at first glance it sort of makes sense you're like okay cool yeah my actions could be reduced to like a set of inputs and like oh you know how do these inputs affect this other model and you know part of what we thought about from a software point of view is um, basically what we call multi-objective optimization and like it's a big term but um, what it is, is that when you train an AI model, you're basically trying to predict an output, right? And you ask yourself, well, what if my objective is not singular output? What if it's multi-output? So say, think about a business that wants to increase revenue, but the way that it increases revenue is by increasing headcount. But headcount might affect business risk in a way that... The more people you have um, and there's sort of fluctuations in demand, you've got to carry those salaries and that might increase business risk. So you can't say to maximize revenue, I can just increase people. That's sort of like a, it's too rudimentary. Like it's, it doesn't capture what's really happening. So the idea is to say, well, have two models that model revenue where the input of a um, other model is actually shared. And what you do is to say, well, the best optimal output is not one answer. It's a series of optimal answers or a competing answers. So you might say, well, I need 10 people. Say 10 people increases business risk 50% but it increases revenue 80%. Or you might say, I need five people, and that increases business risk 5%, but increases business revenue 60%. So then you'd sort of trade off these two optimums to say, well, because they share inputs, I'm now trying to optimize two variables or multiple variables. Therefore, my answer is not just get more people, it's just get five people because I'm not going to achieve 80% increase revenue. I'm going to only achieve 60% input. Um, you know, so that's sort of how we tend to see the world from a software point of view is to build models, um, but also think about how these models interact with one another that sort of achieve a set of best outcomes rather than a singular mm. best outcome. So interesting. So, yeah. I mean, people have known for thousands of years that we live in an interconnected world. I mean, the plants, the nature, I mean, even the concept of Ubuntu is I am because you are, or I exist because you exist. And in a Western kind of world, we've become very individualized, where we've lost the roots of being in a community. You know, and people are, you know, we've got different fingerprints. Um, billions of people have different finger. We are such different beings. So I think, and, and then there are the commonalities, but to automate a person 
um, or to roboticize, if you would, a person, given consciousness, which we still don't really understand, how we make decisions, how our brains even work, you know, and, and I think therefore the, the humanities, I call the humanities the stepchildren of university. So that's art, language, religion, uh, philosophy, ethics. We live in a world where the humanities, the understanding of humans, are becoming more and more important. I'm actually advocating, and I've written about this a lot, that we sh before we just jump in and start teaching coding and robotics to every young person, we have to take them through the fundamentals of the humanities. Because how do we take this most powerful technology if you're not philosophically and ethically grounded, if you, if you don't understand human nature? You know, the, I've read somewhere, and I actually think it's true, that the two most in demand roles in this AI world in the future will be philosophers and ethicists. You know, think of the, the example I often use, and I'm a guy, so what do I know about the birth control pill? But think of this, when what is it, the 50s or 60s when it kind of became mainstream. A lot of people struggled with it ethically, because are we playing God? Are we, can women control their bodies and their, their reproductive cycle, etc.? A lot of debates. Of course, there are still people today who um, don't do it or, you know, ethically or religiously don't use birth control, and that's their right. But I think for most people on earth, birth control is, we don't even think about it. It's just a smart thing to do. But it at the time when that, and we can call it technology, but the ability to control your, your birth cycle, it was, we had to grapple with it because we've never had that ability. So now this technology is opening up new cans of worms, so to speak that we have to grapple with. Mm. So for instance, what about designer babies? So technology already yeah. exists and we think China might be doing it. We take the DNA, the male and female DNA, and you reprogram it. The good we can do there is maybe program out hereditary diseases, heart conditions, etc. But what if I can custom design my baby? Mm. You know, he must be brown, six foot four with blue eyes and a good rugby player. Mm. But again, what about the 99% of the population out there that can never do it? Should we have the ability to custom design mm. this uh, a baby? Imagine the Nazis had this technology. I often think about well, they were this. working towards it. Yeah, but what if we? Because they got rid of all the um, un. What's the word? The un. I'll think of the word now. It's called eugenics. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the unsuitable people. So yeah. Jews, Freemasons, Gypsies, yeah. but even Germans who were born with disabilities, yeah. etc. Let's just get rid of them yeah, all. Physically disabled, mentally yeah. disabled. So will we get to that kind of world again with yeah. technology? And what will be the impact on humans? And I'm just, we don't know. All I'm just saying is, and again, back to where we started, we cannot not have these conversations. We yeah. can't just talk about the tech. We have to imagine where it might take us mm. and already start planning and grappling with it. Yeah, I think humans have this obsession with purity in a way that sort of drives um, what they're trying to achieve, you know, um, purity of output, purity of um, culture, purity of race, whatever um, sort of they, they're trying to do. And, you know, it's not, life doesn't work like that. And I think in in a world where humans sort of in that one painting um i don't know who did it maybe michelangelo where it sort of touched the finger of god mm. you know as soon as we like touch the finger of god in um in what we're doing you know we tend to do a pretty bad job of playing god or or regulating ourselves um you know when we sort of given ourselves that that sort of sort of higher power in a way. Mm. Um, but I think sort of eventually we sort of come to the right conclusions or society adapts or, um, you know, the world sort of finds its way of how to sort of live with that technology or that innovation. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's always that sort of awkward period of, you know, those in the know that, you know, so what if you can have a designer baby that will win everything at the athletics track. You know, it's kind of like doping. It's if you're not doping, you're not winning. Mm. And you ask yourself, well, do you want to win? Yes. So, so you got to dope. So it's kind of like, okay, well, do you want a child? Do you want it to be the most perfect child you can have? Okay. Design a baby. Okay. Mm. There we go. Mm. Um, you know, so it's almost like our, um, we're striving towards like the Instagram life in, in a lot of ways. And, 
and in this sort of interconnected world where keeping up with the Joneses means that I get to see what Kim Kardashian's doing, you know, how am I going to compete with Kim Kardashian? <laughs> you know, like I don't have her looks, I don't have her money, I don't have her network or whatever, but, you know, we tend to compare ourselves to the ideological or that purity um, thing that we sort of trying to chase. Yeah. Um, so it's a very, very sort of interesting mm. area of What I'd like to know from you, Andrew, though, is, is, and I think this will speak to a lot of organizations who are providers of technology and platform. Because where, do one, where does one draw the ethical line? Because, I mean, business is tough. Uh, you need to take the billing that you can take. But what if you're busy consulting with a client and ethically it goes against the grain for you what they want to use this technology for and now or in the future. So it could be getting rid of most people. And so I'm just saying I don't want to come over as I'm naive because I want to be philosophical because mm. life is real, you know, and where do you draw that line? Because you need to make that money, you need to grow your business. But, mm. you know, I think as long as, and I assume and knowing you, but it, you will grapple with it. Um, it does have to bother you when you see they're going to use this technology to displace too many people and so forth. But mm. it is a difficult conversation in the world of business and shareholders yeah. and stuff. But I, what's your, well, how do you approach the it? The good news for everybody is that, um, you know, people are still learning to crawl, um, you know, uh, before they walking from an industry point of view. Mm. You know, we understood the impact that AI will play on businesses a number of years ago and made the conscious effort to build an AI and ML module into Oculus because we knew that when people go on a data journey from basically raw data to insight where basically Oculus plays in that insight, data insight space, we knew that AI would play a, a part, a huge part in that space and data could not be decoupled from AI um, because that's where people are trying to go. It's the natural progression of where the data will lead. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the way that we see it is that obviously we provide a platform for that um, and the actions of the customer are their own um, on the platform. Um, but obviously as a technology provider, we enable um, that to happen. But, you know, just like the database enabled the ability to store big data, um, you know, who would have known that um, the NSA would have scraped all our data and put it in a database and use that to spy on everybody. Um, so in a lot of ways, as a technology creator and technology provider, we don't necessarily know the good and bad ways that um, uh, customers will use um, the, the technology we create. Um, you know, we we assume that they'll use it for good. Um, and you can argue that, you know, would you forego the good for the possibility of creating the bad mm. um, in a lot of ways? So, you know, take um, sort of heart surgery as an example. You know, you could make the argument that um, interfering with a human body is playing God and sort of disrupting the natural occurrence of things. Um, but say that to a person that needs a, a heart replacement. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, you know, one can't necessarily stop what you're doing out of fear of the negatives. You know, I think as long as your, your guiding ethic is um, from a good place, but that's also, it's subjective. Mm. Um, you know, so it, it's it's not a straightforward answer. Yeah. Um, so you would what you need to do is make sure that the organisation you deal with um, sort of has the same fundamental beliefs as you, or um, is aligned with say your belief system as as a business and and your business's ethics, and sort of deal with those technology companies. If that goes sort of against what you believe, then then don't work with them. You know that's sort of the way that I would pass out that tough 
tough yeah. one to deal but with. It's almost like you're a car producer. Should you stop producing cars because some people are going to be drunk drivers? I mean, yeah. you. So as a platform provider, to your point, you know, yeah. you can't control how people will use it. Yeah. You know, but it's it should. I just I think the point is just one should think about it and grapple Absolutely. with it. Absolutely, you know? and it's not a straightforward answer. Absolutely it's not awful. a binary output. You know. Mm. Um, yeah, and like you know, would you would you forego? I mean, I suppose the medical industry does this. I mean, they inject untested medicines into people <laughs> and say, well, okay, cool, you know, you, chances are you'll survive, but mm. maybe not. But, you know, we're trying to save the millions and, uh, you know, we'll sacrifice a couple <laughs> along the way. I mean, it's a tough ethical dilemma. Some other medical industry has, mm. has managed to grapple with that through experimental medicines and things. Yeah. But um, to not talk about it would be to not understand anything mm. you know you know what well, as fathers it's i already see it with with my boy now nine he's a bit older than yours but you know they this technology world that they grow up in i mean we as when you think of your childhood i mean we can't imagine i mean i used to actually play by climbing a tree and falling out of it or with blocks and the other day we had um, a power outage uh, luckily where i live i almost never have one but there was this you know this power problem and we actually had to sit and talk with each other <laughs> because mm. he didn't know what to do now and i control his uh, ipad time and so forth but his ability to just play imaginary games with blocks and stuff mm. is diminished if he doesn't use technology even you know we have more and more problems with our thumbs you know and um the kind of illnesses we can get because you use our thumbs so often typing and so forth eye problems a lot of our children are getting eye problems but they they grow into a world where they are digitally more and more fit hopefully but what will happen if we lose the ability to play creatively you know so as a father i think about those things so mm. and imagine his children one day what kind of world they will live in mm. May, will we start losing part of our humanity you know i heard an interesting talk the other day by a psychologist about the, the role of playing with your children and rough playing, like wrestling and chasing each other around and stuff. And how important that is for your developmental cycle, if you would. And I th we are now outsourcing parenthood to technology. You know, so again, it comes back to that ethical dilemma. What are we producing in children with all these gadgets and stuff? Mm. You know, so as a dad, I mean, yeah. you must be thinking about this too. You Absolutely. Know? And, you know, our modern lives are so busy um, you know, we use technology to just buy us some time to do some other stuff that also needs to be done because yeah. we're so busy doing what we need to do. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's yeah, when you when you have kids, you tend to think about the world a little bit differently. Absolutely. And I mean, if we had this conversation five years from now, mm -hmm. ten years from now, w what type of conversation do you think we'd we'd have? Like, how do you how do you see that. I'm definitely not a futurist, uh, but they say a futurist is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that's not there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah. um, and there are some futurists who are very good at their predictions. Yeah, I think this it, the technology is changing so quickly that it's very difficult to know where we're going to get to in five years. But I mean, just if we had this conversation a year mm. ago, call it the, the pre-chat GPT era, Mm -hmm. and, and it's not the be all and end all, we know that, but it has definitely shifted um, people's view on AI and so forth. Uh, yeah. A lot of companies, content creators, others are really now grappling with tech that they never thought about before. I think in certain instances, we will see huge changes, but it will be focused on where the wealth is, the funding, etc. My fear is that in continents like Africa, we will still pretty much be where we are now in five or 10 years from now, or even worse off. Okay. I mean, we're the fastest growing population in the world, the, the uh, youngest demography in the world. But are we essentially breeding in more poverty and more sickness into this continent? Mm. You know, um, some of the, call it more uh, dystopian parts of me, I think privacy is going to become even a much bigger issue than it is now, but tangibly so. I mean, right now, if there's a data breach, I mean, there's a lot of, like your bank will, there's a lot of things they can do to make sure they minimize it. But, and you might get a debit order go off and they can correct it, or you might get a few cold calls from companies that have your detail and you ignore them. But we haven't really seen the kind of the real effects of what 
how one's life can be destroyed because your data is lost. Mm -hmm. You know, social engineering, and that's one of the things with generative AI, yeah. mimicking your style of writing or, or just reason. photos, compromising yeah. photos with your face that aren't know. even you. It's AI generates. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine the future of law. I mean, can I use a photo or a video as evidence in a court of law, given that it's most likely or very likely not true? It's a deep fake. You know, and case law is lacking far behind in this technology. You know, mm. if a drone flies into a house and somebody gets hurt, is it the drone pilot? Is it the manufacturer of the machine? Is it the people who wrote the algorithm? And so forth, and so forth. There's no case law. We don't know who's guilty. If a chatbot gives me bad financial advice, who do yes. I sue? You know, yes. So I think this, these ethical dilemmas of what it is to be human and what world our children will grow up in, hopefully we will wake up to it. And that's kind of my mission. Not Maybe you can call it a bit of an evangelizing mission, but wherever I get the opportunity, and again, not to make people afraid, but just a bit of a shake up people. We can't screw around with this. Back to the discovery of nuclear power, you know. I want, and every one of us should grapple with it. Don't leave it to government. Don't leave it to the technologist. How will your job change in five years? So I think automation will most likely explode a lot more. I think we're going to see a lot of the job displacements across the world mm. through automation. Um, and that will be a big problem. Mm. Will will we get to a almost a, a Mad Max kind of a world? Again, this um, useless um, race or whatever, or already called it, that I said earlier. Because imagine the, we even just see it when we have a natural disaster, the amount of pillaging, raping, this stuff. It's almost like when we are as animals, if you would, in the corner, the worst comes out of us. There's a great quote I heard one day, and this person said, in every human being, there is a pagan waiting to come out. So when we are pushed to never find work anymore, uh, you can't access healthcare, etc. Can you imagine what kind of world we will live in? So I, I think we are fast on our way to some big problems. Some of them we can avoid, some of them we can't. Uh, so you see, I've done a lot now by not really answering your question because I don't really know. Uh, mm. We can just go into a very bad direction that we should be very careful about, I mm. think. Yeah. So let's leave our listeners with some good news okay. and some, some positive things. So, um, you know, so how have you seen or do you see the positive impact um, that it will have on, on all our lives and sort of the general human experience. Mm. You know, how, how do you see that sort of positive aspect to, to AI? Yeah. Healthcare, definitely. And I already see it. I mean, there's a lot of smaller startup kind of organizations in our country doing phenomenal work with algorithms, with equipment, etc. in the healthcare space, especially from a cancer point of view. Uh, education, you know, this one size fits all schooling system we have across the world is losing its steam. And I hope that it dies. I hated school, you know, so how can we train our children in a better way, personalized to their own strengths, you know? For instance, there's a company I work with that use mobile phone technology to do eye and ear tests in schools, rural area schools. And a lot of times children don't do well, not because they're blind or deaf, but they can't see that well or hear that well. And they won't put up their hand and say, I. I can't. So they fall behind slowly. So this organization and others are using technology in that way. Uh, I think I do think that technology allows us to have a lot more information about our governments, for instance, which should make us more informed citizens. I think there's more and more that governments cannot hide from us. What we as the populace and the, the, the democracy base, if you would do with that, uh, could go either way. Um, it should hopefully connect us more. Now, initially when the internet started, I think the, the excitement there was we are a lot more connected with people from across the world through video calls and social media. Also, um, you know, hopefully we're a lot smarter because we've got access to all the information in the world, you know. But it's almost like technology has done the opposite through the biases in our social media algorithms and so forth. You know, we've become more fragmented um, and we've become dumber because Google is making us stupid. It's the yes. title of a great book. Yes. But hopefully, hopefully we can be a lot more economically empowered and we can be smarter and our children can have a head start in life that we could never have because of technology. It can go either way, but mm. we still have a few years to make sure it goes into the right way. Mm. Uh, but I think especially longevity, a higher quality, healthier life, 
and more economically empowered, I think that's what this technology should be able to do if we do it right. So, Johan, I want to thank you for your time and joining us here on episode three of the Insights Overflow podcast. So I hope all of you listening uh, got some great insights out of this conversation and we'll see you in episode four. Thank you very much.